So, uh, our first panelist here is Mr. Avinash Verma, Director General Indian Sugar Mills Association, popularly known as ESMA. Mr. Verma has 21 years of experience as senior level bureaucrat in Government of India. As DG of ESMA, he takes care of interests of Indian sugar industry, interacts with central and state governments, helps in formulation of policies favorable to the industry. He also represents Indian sugar industry internationally, interacts with international sugar experts, trade houses, and also make presentations in global conferences and seminars. Glad to have you with us, Mr. Verma. Uh, next to him is Shatadru Chattopadhyay. He is Managing Director, Solidarity at Asia. Chitadru is well known for his contributions in the field of sustainability and corporate responsibility. He is founder of several national sustainability standards. He is founding managing director of Solidarity at Initia, one of the world's oldest and most reputed civil society organizations globally. For the last 22 years, he has been working with businesses, governments and multilateral organizations for sustainable trade in global value chains. Then we have Ritu Barua, Regional Coordinator for Bonskuro, which is Global Voluntary Sustainability Standards for Sugarcane. Ritu has been working closely with the farming communities for more than two decades. Her connection with agriculture goes back to the time when organic cotton was being piloted in India with just a group of 150 farmers. She has also worked in skill development sector and has been one of the prominent voices propagating the role of women in development sector. Ritu has joined us with her colleague Rafael Sishias. I think Rafael, uh, you will have to tell me how to pronounce it later when we just come back to you. Uh, Rafael has been with Bonskuro for over 12 years and is responsible for ensuring value to members and demonstrating impact to stakeholders. He is a chevening scholar at University of College London, the University College London, and holds a master's degree in international public policy and bachelor's degree in international relations. Then we have Mr. Naveen Gupta, he is Deputy Executive Director at Talmia Bharat Sugar and Industries Limited. Mr. Gupta works closely with the Managing Director at Talmi Sugar and has over two decades of experience in planning, procurement, monitoring and execution of manufacturing processes as well as setting up of solar plants and thermal power projects. He also leads the technical audit team at Talmi Bharat. Namrata Rana, Director of Strategy and Brand at Futurescape. Namrata has spent over a decade in sustainability domain. Her work focuses on preparing companies for sustainability and net zero transition. She works in the intersection of technology, sustainability, and brand experiences. Namrata has also authored two books, books in these subjects. One is called Shift, Decision for Net Zero World, and other one is called Balance, Responsible Business for Digital Age. Shajumo is an associate counselor at Confrontation of Indian Industry, ITC Center of Excellence for Sustainable Development. He has experience in technical aspects of sustainability issues, such as circular economy and climate change. Shorjumai holds a master's degree in environmental studies and resource management and has been a part of the team that developed India's first bottom-up HFC emissions model. He also worked on the development of GHG inventory and climate MRV system for the state of Sikkim and drafting of the Mizoram state water policy. Last but not the least, we have our moderator, Mr. Vishal Bhardwaj. He is group head CSR and deputy executive, executive director at Dalmia Bharat Group. Vishal leads the CSR function at Dalmia Bharat Group and is also the CEO of Dalma Bharat, Dalmia Bharat Foundation. He started his career with Ministry of Rural Development and later worked in non-profit sector before getting to the private sector. He is certified sustainability assessor as is on several committees of business associations like PICI and CIA. So now that we all know each other and we know primarily we are in the same domain, we work in sustainability, we work on circular economy and uh, make decisions around, uh, say, in making an impact and making our businesses cleaner and, say, impacting. I can let Mr. Vishal Bharzwaj take over from here. Probably he can just take the context of the conversation and then start tagging people. Probably we can just have it in an informal manner and not like having a q a rounds or say putting in questions to each other uh vishal over to you from here thank you thank you so much ranjan uh, thank you for the introduction and as you have already said the rule we'll keep it pretty informal no question answers nothing you know it's it's a kind of a round table we right. would have actually loved to do this physically but uh and we planned that also ranjan but unfortunately you know because of the third wave uh it couldn't happen and uh, then we thought that you know uh, better that we do it virtually this time and then later whenever you know the offices open up then we might actually uh, come together again for the second round uh, and perhaps this round of discussion will also set the agenda 
for the next round of uh, discussions that we can have later so welcome everyone once again uh, uh, to this uh, to this uh, kind of a conversation uh, so you know i'll just set the context you know i've been discussing this with ranjan with namrata with namin with you know some of the other colleagues here uh, you know by virtue of my role as ranjan introduced so you know uh, in the in the dalmia bharat group i actually get to notice the ecosystem of the cement business as well as that of the sugar business <clears throat> and in fact i have had a long association with the cement sector you know almost like two and a half decades now in the cement sector with different companies of which about a decade is actually with dalmia dalmia bharat uh, when i look at these two sectors you know cement which is which is called hard to abate sector uh over the years you know it has actually made a lot of noise about sustainability circular economy uh and and also you know uh, their proactive stance on sustainability you know re100 you look at re100 or ev100 or net zero i think cement sector perhaps i don't know namrata pikna she can correct me factually but i see a lot of noise in the cement sector with all of these cement companies you know jumping into Uh, that race and you know everyone trying to be uh, the the early uh, mover when i look at the sugar sector in fact you know that's that's also about a decade that i have been involved i have actually seen the sugar sector also kind of evolve right uh, i mean to my mind as i look at it you know this is one of the more sustainable sectors that we have today you know you see in you know if i talk of my own company and i am sure there would be other companies in the same uh, uh, frame we produce all of our energy from the renewable sources right so there's there's no dependence on fossil fuel that way there is a huge amount of work that the industry has done on water conservation on soil conservation soil health uh, i think the industry has been very proactive in fact you know this is one perhaps uh, an industry which provides the the largest opportunity in terms of the employment about 50 million farmers uh, uh, you know who are cultivating sugarcane uh, associated with this industry now with the ethanol being produced by the sugar industry i think the fossil fuel uh, the the uses of fossil fuel is is going to you know further reduce sugarcane is a very tremendous crop hai isme se teen char cheeze nikalti hain jo hame use mein aati hain सबसे पहले तो क्यों चीनी हमारा मेन प्रोडक्ट है उसके बाद फाइबर जो हम यूज़ कर लेते हैं बैगास में कन्वर्ट करते हैं और बैगास हमारा पावर प्लांट में यूज़ होता है जिससे एनर्जी जनरेट करते हैं और एनर्जी जो जनरेट होती है उसे हम अपनी डोमेस्टिक रिक्वायरमेंट पूरी करने के बाद सरप्लस पावर को हम सप्लाई कर देते हैं एक ग्रीन एनर्जी का सोर्स है उसके साथ साथ इसमें जो पानी है उस पानी को हम अपने ई प्लांट में ट्रीट करते हैं और ट्रीट करने के बाद इससे अपनी प्रोसेस चलाते हैं जो पानी बच जाता है उस पानी को वापस इरीगेशन में फार्मर्स को देते हैं इसके साथ साथ इसमें हमें मिलता है मोलासिस वो मोलासिस हम डिस्ट्री प्लांट में भेजते हैं डिस्ट्री प्लांट से एम से वहाँ इथेनॉल बनता है और इथेनॉल यूज होता है पेट्रोल के साथ उसमें ब्लेंडिंग करके सो बट यू नो हैविंग सीन ऑल दिस हैपन एंड एज आई टोल्ड नंबर आई डोंट सी दिस इंडस्ट्री क्रिएटिंग दैट नॉइस you know i think we've been pretty silent on our sustainability initiatives or perhaps i live in another world and i haven't heard of that noise but but you know let me go quickly to mr mr verma uh, and and you know mr verma because you look at the industry as a whole both the private sector and the public sector the cooperatives and all of that do you agree with my thoughts or am i are my thoughts misplaced yeah hi thank thanks for that question very relevant and uh, i would certainly agree with you that our industry generally shies away from being too much in the press one reason could be that we are very directly associated with a very large number of farmers traditionally we have not been able to pay to the farmers on time largely because of some government policies which are not favoring us or they are unfavorable to us and as we all know that sugar cane availability is in just about 5 months on an average across the country might be slightly more in some parts or slightly less in some parts but on an average we get our sugar cane cane in 5 months and therefore we crush our sugar cane and have to pay to the farmers basically in those 5 months but 
when we produce sugar, we sell it over a period of at least 14 months. Some extra carrying because the government wants us to carry for that uh, lean period when we don't produce sugar. So therefore, there is a mismatch between the cash inflow and the cash outflow. Number two, sugarcane has become a very political commodity for the government, political uh, sugar crop, because um, the government fixes the price of sugarcane and lets the private sector pay for it. Whereas for other crops, the, the government fixes the price of, say, paddy or wheat, the government also buys that, so there is a direct burden on them. In other cases, like if you talk about corn or coconut or uh, so many other crops like rubber or whatever, the government fixes the MSP, there is no enforcement there. So therefore, sugarcane becomes the only crop in the country where 100% of the farmers get whatever price has been fixed by the government of India and no other crop does that. Now, the other side, sugar is again a political commodity because uh, one day if the price of sugar goes up by a couple of rupees or three rupees and you will see all these news channels, especially not the business channels, but the news channels talking about kal subay aapki chini, aapki uh, chai kalvi ho I mean, come on, three rupees increase and the sugar price does not make your um, uh, cup of coffee or tea bitter. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that sugar and sugar cane have become politically sensitive because you can increase the price of sugar cane and get some political mileage without really paying for the burden of the higher price of sugar cane. And therefore, our industry in the past has been painted as not a very good paymaster as far as sugar cane farmers are concerned. And therefore, I would personally believe that that must be the reason why we are shying from, from being too much in the press. Second is we are not as consolidated as a sector like cement because you don't have many players in cement. You have a, a, a handful of large players there. Whereas in the sugar industry, you have too many players. It's a very fragmented industry. Not only uh, are the players small, we are not able to control the market so much because no large player is there. But you have people from the cooperative sector, you have people from the private sector, you have people in the public sector, and therefore you don't get together. There are varied interests. If you are a cooperative sector, cooperative sugar mill, you might have a very different interest as compared to what you are in the private sector. Then I've also seen the difference in interest between regions, north versus south or the west versus east or whatever. And therefore, my industry is slightly shy of publicity or going uh, hammer and tongs and kind of talking positive about their contribution. But I certainly believe it is high time that this industry, which is really contributing so well to the economy as well as is a real example of a circular economy, because this sector does not waste even one small bit. Everything which comes out of sugarcane, any waste also that used to be called waste is no longer a waste. So we do not throw out anything. We would have loved to use all the water which comes out of sugarcane, but all the water we cannot use because there is a maximum that we can use and therefore the government has allowed us to give out 200 liters per ton of sugar cane, which obviously we process and make it usable for irrigation and give it back to the farmers. So overall, I think this is the best circular economy. Ethanol is a beautiful thing which is coming up. And therefore, it is high time that this industry got together and talked about it very well and conveyed the positivities across uh, the country as well as internationally. Right, right, Mr. Verma. I think uh, one can really understand the political compulsions uh, in the sector. Uh, but yes, of course, I think uh, you know there's a lot uh, that has already been done. You know, since this is a conversation, I, I don't think I'll moderate it to an extent to go to anyone and ask specific questions. So, you know, I would actually invite anyone to, you know, uh, step in. If one can just thought. 
anyone can just unmute themselves and pitch in proper yeah, shujumai yeah. i i'll want you to pitch in here uh, shujumai uh, he just mentioned uh, probably sugar industry is one of the best examples of circular economy as such can we start on with the laying the context of what we laymen like me or say the consumers who are consuming sugar understand about the circular economy and then what does he mean by having sugar industry as the best example of circular economy right uh, maybe what i can do is i can just give i mean just discuss in brief what circular economy is because sometimes what happens is people confuse recycling with circular economy that if you yeah. are recycling that is circular yeah. economy but it's much more yes recycling is a component of circular economy but there's so many more elements to it which people miss out on there's repair there's service there is sharing platforms all of it together makes a ecosystem which is a circular economy so the basic concept of circular economy is very simple and it's such an age old saying that you have to waste nothing everything that we do it's a material right the house that we are sitting in the tea that we are drinking everything is material so the final concept is that you you have to waste nothing so i mean what so there's this uh, foundation called the ellen macarthur foundation and they have done a lot of spearheading work on circular economy so they have actually defined it so well that i'll just i'll just tell you what they say so they have put it into three principles you have to eliminate waste and pollution that means you have to become more efficient so that you reduce pollution you use materials better so improve material efficiency you need to circulate products so whatever you are actually producing you have to keep it in the economy for as long as possible so this is so if you look at the sugar industry it's not only the product which is coming out or the waste that you are utilizing but it's also the machinery maybe which goes into the industry so you have to keep it in use for as long as possible wherever and however you do that and finally you need to regenerate nature so nothing is possible if you are not in tandem with nature and in that context the sugar industry is very unique because you have both the biological side of it and as well as the technical side of it and both of them integrate into one basically and i think mr bharadwaj you had mentioned initially about why the industry has not gone ahead and spoken a lot about it i have not worked personally i have not worked in detail in the sugar industry but with my experience we have worked very extensively in plastics pulp and paper and iron and steel even in cement we are working at this stage right now what we feel helps is credible data so having actually baseline of where we are right now and there are a lot of indicators and circular economy which are out there which can be done at a plant level at a entity level or at a sectoral level if you can synthesize that and put it out with of course there will be assumptions there will be caveats which are associated with it but credible data goes a long way in helping you know move this journey forward and a lot of industries have done that they have worked very extensively to publish data to make databases and then take it forward and that is something we definitely propagate a lot as ci that this needs to be done and uh, other one more I just wanted to touch on one more small element maybe not linked directly but uh, which should be looked at is packaging because eventually the product is sold in the market with it's packaged into something right so the packaging which is used should also be looked at from a circular economy aspect so are there reuse models which can be put in place can the packaging be made more recyclable than it is it is right now so if say for instance you are using plastics if you have multi polymer multi layer plastics can you move to mono layer multi layer plastics because they are more recyclable so at the end of life the recycler has value to the material that he is getting so that is something which can be explored as well yeah mr bhardwaj uh, yeah thank you thank you so much for that in fact you know i agree i mean uh, reliable data of course uh, needs to be there uh, you know for for one to talk about and you know i'll perhaps request you know namin for you know for for coming in and i mean do you think we have that kind of reliable data within the fence you know the from the technical aspects and then perhaps go to ritu or to shatradu to understand the beyond the fence uh, aspect of data i mean do do we really have the reliable data that we can talk about certainly we shall uh, you know 
as you would be knowing and you know we being in the same organization we have been talking frequently on this <laughs> and i know it is because we are also bond sukra certified for one of our mills and when we have been working together in fact bond sukra asked for a lot of data okay mm-hmm. that data is getting maintained that data is getting audited okay so data is available and this data can be verified only issue is ki whether we want to really put it in the public domain without really harming the industry or our competitors one of the reasons being that when we talk about you know ours is a industry not owned by the larger groups but it's a fragmented industry being that way there is lot of variation between the data of the good mills which are being maintaining and we are doing everything versus the mills which are being run by the individuals you know there are many politicians you know all of us know in our sugar industry so they have also been operating the mills and particularly for those mills if you ask me for the data it may be difficult to ask okay now to take it forward kushal when we were talking about the circular economy and uh, why sugar industry is not really doing a blowing their trumpet and uh, going to the industry saying okay, okay this is what we are doing one of the primary reason being as mr varma ji has already explained that this being a political matter so people generally keep a low profile second is the payment part so i am not going into that but as far as the circular economy or when we talk about that what exactly do we waste when the came comes to us you know i'll take little more into as ranjan was saying that for a layman what the sugar industry is doing so when the sugar cane reaches us we just crush it we have the juice flowing on one side and the bagas on the other side okay from the juice we have got four products one is the final sugar we have second is the molasses we generate nowadays we generate b molasses or c molasses and from both the molasses government has permitted and accordingly we take it to distillery generate ethanol we market this ethanol through the oil marketing companies so we straight away pass it on to them we can always manufacture rs or ena so these are the other products we have. then the spent wash gets generated in the distillery that again goes to the insulation boiler or that goes for biocomposting okay in the biocomposting we have the press mud we mix that and we produce organic manure which again goes to the fields you know completing the whole cycle that it has come from the field it goes back to the field similarly from the insulation boiler we get steam and power which gets utilized in the plant whatever is the surplus power that again goes to the grid and whatever ash gets generated you know that is very rich in potash so insulation boiler ash itself is such a value added product for our cane fields it really goes back to the field potash in that is in the range of 18 to 20% which is really good for the soil fertility the other products which we are getting over there is the press mud which is again rich in nitrogen phosphorus potassium you know npk value we generally mention it so all these products are there we use lime in the process so calcium is there calcium is available in the press mud good for the field iron is there and the sulfur is there so all these contents add to the soil fertility again adding up to our production ke okay our yields will increase when we are using the press mods either through biocomposting or whatever way in the field it adds to the productivity in the field the last product which we have is the condensate the water you know sugar cane itself contains 70% of the water okay through the evaporation process as a part of the process condensate gets generated we treat it and we use it you know and today the technology has developed to an extent that we are able to recycle this water even for the power production we have the high pressure boilers and of late this year only we have been able to really successful in utilizing the treated water in our boilers so practically at two of our mills we have been able to achieve zero ground water extraction even in the power plant we are able to recycle this and after this also if something surplus is left out that goes to the fields okay so if you look at the bagas the other product which was the bagas bagas is again taken to the boilers we generate power we generate steam utilized within the plant power goes to the grid in fact 25% of power only gets utilized in the plant and 75% of our power which is a green power you know just produced out of bagas goes to the grid and the fly ash which gets generated again is rich in carbon and silica so again utilized in the fields adding to the soil fertility and the fly ash in some cases we are manufacturing the bricks also so nothing goes waste and if you look at cane itself you know in the cane also what exactly is available the main cane part has come to us the dry leaves which are left over there 
again the mulching process is there which is adding to the soil fertility retaining the moisture over there so that is also helping us nothing goes waste some of the farmers also use it for the purpose of making their sheds in the farms and all that and the top green part of the cane that is being used as a fodder so really the cane production from production and cycling producing sugar and all those things you know and other things that's adding to the economy on one side adding to the welfare of the farmers and the villagers on the other side and making it a circular economy because it goes back to the fields that's it. yeah namrata i think they can't be a better example of circular economy than sugar industry i agree i think it's uh, awesome how uh... you know navin ji just explained the the whole thing how the whole thing comes together and nothing really is wasted but you know i have a theory <laughs> which is that the more polluting the company the more they talk about sustainability right <laughs> so my feeling is that the the sugarcane industry is perhaps not that polluting and have not realized the benefit of talking about sustainability so loudly so perhaps that effort has not gone into it because it is it is by its very nature uh, 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 you know as as just described fairly fairly beneficial to everybody all around not very wasteful as well uh, in that sense perhaps uh, you know somebody needs to look at what are the value chains that are being created that are going to benefit the industry commercially if you were to talk about sustainability so for all the highly polluting industries it does benefit them to talk about sustainability because they say you know we are not so bad hum se kharidiye we we are not so terrible we'll give you uh, green products better products uh, either to business to business customers or to business uh, to to direct consumers as well so somewhere that sustainability narrative helps and uh, the the sugarcane industry the by products are several and and directly are being consumed so maybe there is there some something worth thinking within that i think rafael has something to say uh thank you and thank you narata i was going to say exactly the same and uh, it's very interesting i'm learning a lot by the way so it's great to hear uh, from all of you i think uh, one one thing i like preparing for this conversation today i was thinking about so we have um, a new way to view uh, sugarcane uh, so if you look at the sugarcane as a as a crop uh, from a, an energy point of view uh, you have a, a a split of energy into the you know the sugarcane juice the bagasse and tops and leaves that is it's basically 33% uh, each one of those in terms of the energy content of sugarcane so you know we always say that if uh, if you're not using one of those three elements you're literally throwing money away right so, so it is very important to use all of all everything that comes from the plant and the point you said i think is very very important is really about how can you link the the story around sugarcane to other products that have a, a sensitivity to sustainability issues right so we have some examples in bon sucro i mean the most famous one is tetra pak right is a big uh, uh, corporate company producing packaging where they are using sugarcane derived bioplastics in their cartons and um this can be done through polyethylene which is a, a, a product from from et from ethanol uh, there is the polylactic acid which is another bioplastic that can be made from sugar so that's another example and and it creates a very positive narrative as well on the impacts of biomaterials right which is part of circular economy the other example which i really like there is a company called uh, aprinova in the us they buy uh, a product made from sugar, from ethanol that is called squalane that is used for hand creams face creams all, all sorts of cosmetic uh, cosmetic products and it's a very interesting story because the, the alternative to this sugarcane based product is uh, comes from shark livers and and before in the past millions of sharks were being killed every year Uh, to produce squalene from shark liver to produce cosmetics and now this is being replaced with uh, sugarcane material so it, it, you know it has a direct impressive biodiversity impact protection impact as well so i think i think we have many examples in argentina for example over 80% of all the paper production in argentina is made from bagasse 
you know, you have examples in other countries or, or, or in the energy matrix. I know in India, for example, as well, as you said, the, the production of energy from bagasse, the use of ethanol in vehicles, right, through mandatory uh, uh, biofuel mixing with the gasoline. So I think there are many positive positive stories and is, is really about identifying where where those stories are and how sugarcane is making a difference in, in those other sectors. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rafael. In fact, I was just thinking that, you know, one of the one of the benefits that we have had by doing this virtually is that we could all we could also have you join us. Uh, had we done it physically in Delhi, perhaps we would not have had you as part of this uh, group. But anyways, uh, uh, Shtadru and uh, Ritu, you know, your thoughts on this? Hey, maybe I can start since yeah. probably Ritu is enough time. And so thank you for this opportunity. I would talk about two aspects <clears throat> you mentioned. One is <clears throat> why sugar industry is a little shying away from making those claims of sustainability. And the second element is on the data. I think those are the two elements you've talked about. Uh, honestly, for 22 years having exclusively done sustainability and dealing with different commodities. In every commodities segment I talk and I said, every sector claims they are the most sustainable, they are the most circular. So we have to take it a little bit cautiously when we say that we are the most sustainable. Every crop is sustainable and every crop could be made unsustainable if we do not take precaution. And there are classic examples in sugarcane where when good precautions, good, good care is taken, that could become one of the most sustainable crops. So those are exp ex examples, but you can grow sugarcane in the most unsustainable way also, if you would like to do that. Same happens with palm oil, same goes with soya beans, same goes with cotton and many other crops. Uh, so no crop is inherently sustainable, I mean, on its own. You have to take certain precautions. I mean, uh, that's that's one. The second element is, I think Indian uh, people are by nature circular. They, we don't throw away anything and uh, we, we value everything. And uh, our f earliest uh, found, you know, proponent of circular economy were the Kawadiwalas, who used to collect things from our doorsteps and, you know, give shape to something else. So, uh, but the issue is, why should we look into these aspects now? Why it has been shying away? I think because probably the business case was not very clear to the sugarcane industry. If you are not very clear about the business case of sustainability, you will not make much bigger claims. And if you know about the business case, any industry will do the claims in a bigger way. Political or apolitical doesn't matter because there is money to be made. For example, sugarcane could be one of the major uh, uh, prop, uh, you know, supplier of carbon in the world today. As per the latest findings, one can see that per hectare, sugar can, can sequester it around 6 .0 0.66 tons of carbon. You know the carbon rates today going between 20 to $30 per ton. And that kind of uh, carbon we have shown in Solidarity Zone activities, we have average, we are getting 360,000 tons of carbon you know, sequestered out of sugarcane with some new methodology, we can do it very well. Secondly, water we talked about, we are trading in water when we trade in sugarcane and that nobody is paying for that water. People are paying for carbon, but people are not paying or the companies are not paying for water. One can easily generate carbon and water, both credit systems. We work with Rabobank, one of our Netherlands based uh, partner banks, they have created an auction system for carbon where companies can buy those carbon credits. We are talking about generating similar kind of a water bank from where the water credits could also be purchased. All this money can come back to sugar industry. This is what our farmers, our own people, they are generating. So the farmers are no longer just farmers of sugarcane. They are also farmers of, they are farming carbon. They are farming water. They would be farming energy as well as we go in future. But because of that, we need to also look at a new element that is the data, because the data is becoming very, very critical. In order to generate the carbon credits or the water credits, we need impeccable data. And therefore the farmers has to be data farmers also. But then the question is whose data is that? How do we create credent credible data? And that's where Solidarity is working on generating uh, data 
your fair data mechanism because today any data could be manipulated any data nobody can trust the data we saw in the american elections how the data was creating a issue today there is a credibility issue of data we have integrity issues in organic cotton there were big questions being raised in new york times about the credibility of our organic certification therefore the importance of data and transparent and traceable data becomes important my last point this is very crucial because europe is going through a major transition and its ripples will be felt in india also europe is going through a has developed the green deal and the due diligence act in which most of the companies which will be supplying products to europe will have to demonstrate in a traceable and a transparent way from where their product is coming from and also adhere to many of these green deal requirements of sustainability now of course it is not meant for the countries in asia it is meant for products that will go to europe however the companies operating in europe will be probably ask this question that whether they were you going to use the same framework uh, in other markets where they operate you can't have two two tier kind of activities that one deal for europe and another deal for india or china so in those process the traceability will become even more important and the data will start playing a very important role but the question is this data is whose data this data is owned by the farmers and how are we going to give that do the data has a value data is the new oil how should we ensure that 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 price that well, that the genuine uh, benefit of that data goes back to the farmer this is where i think we need to work together it will benefit everyone the farmers the sugar farmers the sugar companies and and overall the sustainability agenda in totality i think we can discuss more about it but these are the two short comments from my end i'd like to step in here now and uh, great to hear from all of you uh, thank you for putting all of us together on one screen here i think it's 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 really been uh, the most important part for me uh, you know there are challenges everywhere challenges in all sectors in all industries and i think the biggest challenge for me as i've seen it over the years is that we're all working in silos so we, we we fail to come together we fail to bring in all this expertise that we have on one platform to address uh, one common goal that we all believe in. and i think everybody present here understands knows the importance of sustainability it may become a barrier of entry going forward you know if we are not going to prepare ourselves uh, you know for the sectors that we are working in if we are not going to prepare the key players in this there will be setbacks and there is a lot happening globally i mean even for us at bon sucro and that's why i requested rafael you know to join us today because i think we have just limited our views you know we've just stuck to certain areas that oh and certain organizations being looked at for example bon sucro that bon sucro just works with standards and certifications no we want to be the platform we like the engagement we are inviting partnerships we want to come together with key players to to create a value around the work that we are doing like all of us are doing so i think that's that's one very uh, very very critical part and i think there is a uh, we are all responsible for that and how this coming together is going to happen and what that platform is going to be for for me is a very critical question and uh, just coming from a very personal experience i want to say here that you know when we started work in india it was really a very tall tall task and for me it was like really a steep climb uh, there weren't too many people who were willing to interact understand come forward and i'm really thankful to the mills and our members who who you know who who braved that and you know are a part of this uh, this journey with us today so we have grown step by step we have grown slowly but now we feel that you know we are ready and i think the same thing applies for the industry i mean i i you know i take very well what uh, mr varma has said you know what shatadru has said and of course navin ji comes from all the experience of the industry itself that i think that there comes a point you know when you when you first are working towards something you create the foundation for that work and then you're willing you're ready to take it on to the next stage and i feel and please correct me you know if i'm wrong here uh, you all have more experience than me i think we are the industry is at that stage and if we don't sort of take the benefit of you know where we are placed today we'll probably you know may may, may slip again 
So I think it's an important part. There is, you know, a lot has opened up uh, even globally. Uh, and I think we should take advantage of that. As far as bon sucre is concerned, I mean, uh, most of you are familiar with the way we work. Uh, yes, at the core of the work is the production standard. We, we that you know, we we like to work as a platform. But yes, the the production standard, the metrics, uh, the metric calculator, this, this is still at the core of our work. And the data that we collect, of course, is you know we we uh, we realize the importance of it. And just like Shatadhu said, and how how is data? Where is the data going to come from? Uh, you know, is the verified data, how credible is the data? We also work on those things, those points very closely. We rolled out, we realized the challenge that India works with such large numbers of farmers that it's a very big challenge. And then the smallholder standard was rolled out so that to make it easier. But it's a process, it takes time. It's it's a step by step, but it's a stepwise approach. And I think that is what we need to be together in to understand the importance of what work, all of what value all of us bring to the sector and to come together to take it forward. Uh, yeah, and um, okay, I'll stop there and then maybe carry on later because, you know, these are, this is a, this is a general field that I've had over the years, uh, you know, working here. I'm very happy to say that Today I feel, and you know, I was just talking to uh, Ranjan uh, yesterday and I told him, I said, you know, I myself was shy of uh, approaching people, talking to people so much uh, earlier. But after having worked here for now and stabilized for the last four years, I feel even at Bon Sucro, and especially for the program here in India, I think we are ready to, you know, sort of take the next step. We are ready to take it forward. But I'm not going to do it alone. And I'm really serious about this. You know, we, we really need some solid commitments. We need some solid partnerships to come forward and to do this together. And I think this is also a part of the way, uh, you know, the global strategy at Bon Sucro is. We want to collaborate. We want to be inclusive. We want to develop partnerships. Because it's not, any, I mean, no, none of us, however good we are and you know, whatever organizations we come from, are going to be able to achieve any of this alone. So really for me, I take this opportunity, you know, to sort of reach out to everybody to see, hey, what is it that we can do together? How can we come together and sort of work to make this better? We are all doing very, very, very good work, but just let's all try and put it together somewhere. Yeah, so, so Ritu, it seems so like yeah, so it seems like all the good people has come together on this platform. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Gupta mentioned about <laughs> Mr. Gupta mentioned about good meals and the bad meals as well. So when we're talking about circular economy and sugar and these industries that we're talking about, we have Bharat Group here industries. Now he's mentioned he's like taking care of all the byproducts as well. Uh, but what is it that the bad meals are not doing? Probably Mr. Verma or Mr. Gupta, uh, you can point out several things, several aspects that have to be taken care of or probably the bad meals have to work upon. And then the second one for Chatadru, he mentioned about the carbon sequestration. Who is the owner of those credits? Is this the mills who get the credit or is it the farmer who gets the credit out of it? So probably we can start from Mr. Verma, he can mention about the things that are not being done at several mills. Uh, that need to be taken care of and then move on to the sequestration part. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> let me first react to both the ladies. I think both the ladies make very pertinent points, but let's let me react to Namrata's point that unless and until you are under attack, you don't react. And therefore, she was saying that the most polluting industries or so-called most polluting industries react and try to prove that they are doing a good job and they are not polluting. And uh, I would say that on that front, we are still not under attack that we are polluting because we are known to actually establish systems. It's a different matter that we don't use the systems properly and voluntarily create a problem. But as an industry or as a system, we have effluent treatment plants and we are required to have those systems to ensure that we don't pollute and we do sustainable work. So I agree, Namrata, there that uh, uh, we are still not under attack, so therefore we don't react. But yes, we are under attack, as mentioned by my friend from Saudi Arabia, that uh, we are using a lot of water. And therefore we need to find ways to reduce the consumption of water or consumption of fresh water. How do we do that? Uh, 
uh, reacting to uh, uh, my friend Rita Jitu Barwa. Uh, yes, uh, when you are actually struggling to survive, you don't really think about the social benefits or the social cause or sustainability issues. On uh, the specific question about what the industry is doing, what the industry is not doing, some of the sugar companies are not doing. Uh, let's also uh, understand that uh, a lot of the production, a lot of the industry is not really corporate in the true corporate sense. And therefore that corporate responsibility or that image building is not really there. We are not, some of us are not very conscious of kind of portraying that we are good because we are a single unit we just want a particular kind of thing like a profit generation or we want to kind of help we are a cooperative society so therefore companies like if i may name so dalmia or dcm shriram or the large companies who are more conscious about their image or want to build it up they are the people who have started talking about sustainability so therefore, that may be another reason that we are not really corporate or don't have big corporate houses uh, in large numbers that we are talking about sustainability issues and kind of partnering with Bon Sucro or uh, people who want to help us on that front. Right? That's what I wanted to mention. Yeah. Tadru, if I may just step in here for 30 seconds, huh? sorry, just to take, say, you know, uh from Mr. Verma that and also you know Ranjan there are no good industries and bad industries I think everybody has a fairly good intention I think the whole question is that of resources because you need to have you know it's like like Mr. Verma said that you know the industry also was struggling in the past and has been even now to sort of stabilize because of the whole uh, ethanol blending program and I think the question is that of resources so when there is a stress on resources, you know, people just, you tend to sort of narrow it down to the basics. Uh, and really most people whom we have come in contact with have been had very good intentions. People are doing very good work. There is a lot happening at the mill and the work at the farm level, at the agriculture level has, is also beginning to change. The way we are looking at, you know, dealing with the smallholder farmers, with the challenges that they face, I think there is a lot of investment that is coming in there. So the whole question is that of resources and how we sort of put all of this together. So yeah, just that. Thanks, Shatadru. And Shatadru, you know, before you take it on, I mean, uh, just, I'll, I'll add another point to this and perhaps you know, would request you to respond to that also. Now, I was I was going through Bon Sucro website and I noticed that they claim that three fourth of GHG emissions are attributed to the to the farm, right? In the sugar in the sugar industry, uh, you talked of carbon sequestration. So where are we net net? Yeah, Shatadu. Sorry, I thought you asked this question to. Uh... Someone else. Uh, so since since we were all coming to you, I thought I'd rather ask you this. Oh, okay. In okay. fact, I also intended to ask you this because you know you know that we are together working on a project uh, in Maharashtra to reduce the carbon footprints in the sugarcane farming. So I thought you would respond to that. No, yeah, absolutely. I had an addition to that question, Shatadru, which is that uh, do you think the establishment of the carbon markets in India would really help in elevating the stature of the sugarcane industry? Uh, okay, I think first uh, first part is uh, when uh, it is very clear that the to generate credits, a program has to show uh, new practices uh, in the field and uh, how it is. It has to be measured that how it is affecting the greenhouse emissions or greenhouse gases. For example, showing cover crops or reduced tillage and you know. Uh, added carbon to the soil requirements, etc. So it happens in the field. So uh, obviously this uh, carbon credit goes to the farmers. Uh, so however, now having said so, there are, I think, a possibility to compensate. Sugarcane is a unique industry in a one way, in certain way, because it's the only industry I have seen which spends huge amount of money to support farmers to grow uh, in a sustainable way. It doesn't happen in the cotton 
the sh- cotton mills, the ginners or spinners are not spending money for imp- or deploying staff to support farmers. Uh, we don't see that happen in soya bin. We don't see that happen in palm oil. Well, some, somewhat in palm oil, but not too much. So in this case, uh, there is a possibility of having an agreement between the farmers group and the mill to kind of uh, cover the cost of generating the carbon uh, and therefore at least the cost of the industry spe- you know, beers to provide the support for extension partially could be you know, uh, covered. But that's not all. It could also have the component of water. I think our we were sugar industry has been criticized on water aspect as mr verma rightly mentioned at the same time we can turn the story completely and make it our strength if we can use water credit platforms and when we say that we are not just selling sugar but also water and we should the farmers should get compensated for water efficiency mechanisms on the ground it will automatically kind of pay back for the water use efficiency programs and number three also on many other elements like uh, you know precision agriculture could help uh, through the data and that's that's the third area which can pay off now of course the starting of carbon markets in India will help in in addressing these issues uh, virtual things are increasingly becoming uh, monetized you know so impacts be it credit of carbon is getting monetized and it is accepted when we have you know cryptocurrencies are now increasingly accepted you will see that there will be a carbon market where you know there will be a regular trade which will happen on carbon and water credit this is an area where probably in my understanding it can already provide around 20 dollars per hectare for uh sugarcane now it may not be very big just on carbon between 15 to 20 dollars and if this is only through the carbon sequestration if the farmers also grow few trees on their pla- <clears throat> on their uh, on the surrounding and the bordering of those sugar uh, field it can even get even further another 10 to 15 dollars per hectare so there are great possibilities of leveraging this new space which is there yet there is a risk and one risk is the ethanol market in Europe is going down because they have decided to go for electrification. So biofuel and this is no longer a priority for Europe. Uh, by 2030, there is a plan to do away with completely with this biofuel element and move more on electrification. So the, our industry needs to be geared up for those requirements also. But in this entire process, do you think there's a huge skills gap and a knowledge gap that needs to be bridged between the people who propagate sustainability and the benefits and the associated issues around it? Because, you know, the fact that we are we are having a conversation around this, it's it's I'm, I'm sure that these conversations are not very frequent. I totally agree with you. I think that's exactly what we are trying to do with uh, Dalmia Sugars, uh, to set up a good example. If we can create such an example where a sugar farmer also acts as a carbon farmer and uh, provide, and they can benefit from both the uh, advantages of sugar, increase yield, reduce water, and uh, better carbon credits. And what kind of trainings are needed? What kind of data is needed? all those are worked out, then it could set a good example for many other industry players who could, you know, adapt those practices. I'm delighted that Dalmia being a kind of front runner in this this kind of format has come forward and tried to come, <coughs> agreed to do this experiment with us. Yeah. So, you know, in fact, I have another very layman kind of uh, an opinion on water. Water, in fact, has been talked several times in our conversation already. You know, as a layman, when I look at Punjab, rice and wheat cycle, with that rice and wheat cycle, the water table has gone down drastically as I compare it with our areas, our sugar area in UP. You know, there the reduction is perhaps about a meter in 10 years, right? That's what the groundwater data that we, we've gathered shows. So, you know, why is the industry then blamed for having that kind of a water footprint you know, when, when you compare it with other crops like wheat and, and rice. 
I think for global perspective, if I have to come in here, uh, uh, <clears throat> it is a very unique situation because the same kind of argument is used in palm oil when we say that, you know, palm oil is caused for deforestation. If you look at uh, all other vegetable oils, you will require 20, 10 to 12 times more land area to grow the same amount of oil as palm oil is. But having said so, it doesn't take away the fact that the, there is a la hundreds and thousands of uh, hectares of forest being converted for palm oil. So these are also reality. So when you compare it, of course, palm oil comes as the most uh, efficient oil on earth. Similarly, when you compare sugarcane with wheat, it will not, obviously it will be much more efficient. But the fact is that, that it does require a lot of sugar. And unfortunately, in some sugar companies, some sugar species, they follow flood irrigation practices and do not take care of uh, proper land management, soil management, proper bonding technologies. Lots could be done. So just because we have the water doesn't make sense to, you know, do all the bad practices. When it, with a very simple uh, me me measures, one can save, for example, solidarity. I can give you one example. We have saved with 100,000 farmers, with a very minimum practices, 750 billion liters of water in one year. This is These are assured figures. These are not my figures. These are third party assured figures with companies like DSCL and others with whom we have worked. And uh, it's possible. We didn't do anything big. We just did trash mulching. We did some bonding. We helped the farmers with the decent practices. You can save so much of water. So why do you want, why do we want to, you know, use excess water when it, the and the yield level went up by 37%. So the, it is not at the compromising at the yield level. So uh, why do we need to, you know, uh, spe uh, exhaust all our water resources if we can do it in a better way? That's, that's the reason why the progressive companies are, you know, seen as a, you know, as a model for others to follow and take up these activities. In fact, let, uh, let, let, let me add. Uh, sorry, sorry, Vishal. Please go ahead. No, no, no. Sir. Uh, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, I was trying to add to the point uh, that you also mentioned, Vishal, is with regard to the. I would also partially blame the government policies uh, on the farm sector. First of all, you are seeing now the elections are happening. You are seeing the politician, political parties announcing free power to the farmers. Now, when I, mean, when I talk about survival of a farmer, a farmer's income, we know where it is. And therefore, a farmer who's trying to survive or struggle to survive cannot think about reducing water consumption or think about better uh, technology or ways to reduce that water. His power is free or the water is free. Why should he even bother about doing anything about reduction in the use of water? Yes, the industry can help him etc. Et can happen. Secondly, what has happened? What has happened is the prices of some of the crops have been increased in such a fashion that those have become more profitable, more remunerative to the farmers. Like for example, if you talk about sugarcane, it pay pays you almost 50 to 60 percent more than any other crop in the country. So even in places where you do not have enough water, where you are scarce of water, we are we are being blamed for using almost 80% of the irrigated water in a particular state, we still do not think about shifting out of sugarcane. The latest that the government did was kind of make MSP less attractive because as mentioned in Punjab, they continue to grow, grow more of paddy and more of wheat because they have an assured market, assured buyer, assured price. And therefore, if you kind of change the policies, that will be a kind of a signal to our farmers to look at more efficient um, water using crop or better kind of crop, which is more sustainable. Uh, yes, the industry can come in, but uh, I mean, basically, when a farmer is looking at his profit, he's not bothered about other things there. Right, right. In fact, you know, I was... I, in fact, wanted to come to you only, Mr. Verma, you know, on water issue. I mean, 
to my mind i think it's more about the perception uh, that we have you know it's a hearsay you know one hears that sugar cane is a water guzzling crop and then you know it propagates like i said you know from my understanding there i mean it's perhaps competitive when it comes to sugar when it comes to wheat and and paddy so i was just wondering that you know can we be slightly more vocal perhaps using the isma platform and then you know edu- educate the 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 consumers that you know look this is a perception and this is perhaps not true yes vishal i mean uh, as i mentioned now probably is the right time when we are moving from a survival stage to a slightly more comfortable stage when we can we can or we should talk about these things i remember having written an article in financial express almost about 5 years back that sugar cane crop should not be singularly looked at a water guzzler mm-hmm. and i did a comparison i said people should look at per month consumption of water by a crop because what we do we look at say 12 months consumption of water and say look here this is a water guzzler but if we compare that with two or three crops that the farmer takes for 12 months including say paddy then per month consumption of water by sugar cane reduces and then i said that look at what we say in the energy sector is we well to be kind of a thing so look at the, from the point of the crop to the consumption point so when you give me sugar cane to the industry the industry correctly speaking is not drawing fresh water except on the first day correctly speaking i mean we do take out water but we should not be taking out any fresh ground water because whatever water is available in sugar cane we are processing that water recycling it and using that water in our processing system and even after that we are giving out about 200 liters of water per ton of sugar cane back to the farmers for irrigation which is considered to be more productive and high yielding because that water has a lot of other nutrients secondly that is the so the sugar industry is a net water generator if i may say so unlike any other industry which uses any other crop all the industries would draw water whereas a sugar cane based industry does not draw water when you bring that sugar to your household you don't again use water you would like to clean your um, pulses you would like to clean your rice or your wheat so you use water to clean it then when you are actually cooking then again you use water whereas in sugar you do not so if you do that well to wheel kind of use of water you will find that sugar cane probably comes in the middle of the chart and i had also done the study and i said something like beef when you talk about beef beef production uses much much more water than sugar cane so i mean these are the things i mean you are right that we should now start talking about these things and convey to the to the consumers or the ordinary citizens that we are not bad sir in fact as you mentioned now the time has come so we can always do the comparison that on a per metric ton basis or on a per hectare basis you know on a per hectare basis if we look at you know how much water is required by the sugar cane it's around 3000 sorry in 1500 mm and out of 1500 mm irrigation also 1000 mm particularly in up and northern part comes from rains so what we use from the ground is only 500 mm okay and on per ton basis if we look at the data available so cane requires only 70 kl of water per metric ton of cane whereas wheat requires 450 kl so only thing is that duration within which the wheat gets produced and it's you know finally shipped out so that duration is less people don't look at that and it's 12 months crop so it takes so much time but it takes 1500 kl of water per ton so if we look in terms of tonnage you know that could be one metric second metric could be on a per hectare basis what it could be and since now we have come to a platform we have reached a level wherein we can talk about this and educate the general public that sugar cane is not a water guzzler so i think that's where you need to come forward and yeah. we are there to I mean, one more point you are very right in addition to whatever we are saying we should also add that from the same quantum of water you are not only producing sugar you are yes. producing power you are producing ethanol you are uh, giving out biocompost etc etc right so from 
that water you are only getting this much of rice but from that water you are getting sugar ethanol power uh, press mud bio compost etc etc right. i mean there are arguments but as i mentioned to ritu that we were struggling to survive now that we are kind of um, at a more comfortable position we should start talking about these things right. i would have to save my job also here no no <laughs> <laughs> That is very secure. I don't think anybody would want you to go anywhere else. <laughs> no, no. This industry will say, "Ab toh aara kam khatam ho gaya. We are fine. We are enjoying our life. We can go home." So I, have to find that, that, that's for <laughs> I, I would agree with you, David. Yeah. Then, to ask, also ask about uh, one or two more things that uh, what's not going right. You know, on that side, if you talk about ki whatever is the residue available, you know, from uh, cane in the form, not everybody is going for mulching. okay if you go for mulching you are increasing the water retention capacity of the soil you are able to utilize it increase the carbon content but it is not happening 100% things so a lot more can be done on that yeah so i second is one. second is on the water side also we have been talking about the micro irrigation and the drip irrigation sprinkler systems of course uh, in maharashtra and all this is becoming a success but in north again there is a problem that farmer do not like to go for it even after whatever subsidy the government can provide and we can provide they don't look merit in this we tried it a lot but some over the other because of water being available in plenty they are not really interested in adopting these measures so that's where we require additional efforts to ensure that whatever water is available let it remain under the ground and let's utilize these things in fact we try to educate the farmer saying that it's not only saving of water but it's saving your fertilizer as well because fertilizer directly goes to the roots and wherever this was applied fields were demonstrated to various farmers we took them ke, okay this is the demonstration form we did lot of work over there took our farmers over there ke, you please look over here how much fertilizer they were applied they have seen it but somehow or the other this is not getting populated so that's where we can do lot more So just taking on from what I've heard now, from you know, from Shatadru and from you, Naveen, she's saying that you know there is going to be so much of uh, resources, investments, uh, which will come now to sort of address these issues. What is extremely important for I think for all of us to know, and especially I mean, it's of great interest to me, is to see how we can replicate the learnings of these. uh projects you know uh, i know that the meetha sona project that was done by dcm shiram was yes. you know has went a long way and they did really good work and it was done in collaboration with solidarity as with ifc i think coke was also involved so again it was you know so many people coming together to do that but what i really missed is that how did we pick up the learnings from those projects and replicate it how did we sort of you know take it to the next level or to the next lot of farmers or to the next organizations that we are working with and if we were to do that i mean not only for water but for all the other issues that we've been talking about what is the kind of what are the things that we need to bring together you know whether it is knowledge whether it is finance uh, you know who are the people who are going to lead it so where is the expertise going to come from i think we we need to sort of put these things together well so that we can talk about it you know why hold ourselves back and if like all of us are saying i'm saying that you know i feel better and more confident about you know what bon sukra has done in the last four years in india and i'm happy now i feel more sure of myself to be able to take the next steps i mean as you saying okay you know the industry has stabilized you know we can now start talking about other issues shatadru says we've done so much good work in in projects you know we've done such there is there is so much material available but how are we going to put all these resources together to really make an impact and to make a difference i think that is something that we i mean if we can come together and discuss that that will be really excellent i think uh, ritu very valid point because see the way we see ourselves as an industry and since i'm attending this i'm just saying ourselves uh but i'm certainly an outsider in this is that is perhaps not the same way that the outside world consumes that knowledge and that information so perhaps i think what needs to be done is to translate that knowledge that information into consumable pieces of information that can actually be dripped out into the external world 
so that it can be consumed in the way that you want to portray yourself. Right, right, Namita. Uh, you know, can I can I rope in Rafael for a moment here? Uh, Rafael, you know, Dalmia Sugar. We were, uh, you know, we were working on our sustainability report uh, uh, about four or five years ago. In fact, uh, we were the first sugar industry in India to to bring out the sustainability report. You know, that time we wanted to benchmark ourselves, right? And we were looking around for data of other sugar industry in the public domain. Unfortunately, you know, we didn't come across much of that data, right? And today also, I think we have talked of the criticality of the data. You know, how is it in the global scenario? I mean, is there a lot of data available, a lot of reliable data available outside India? Um, that's a difficult question. It's hard, it's hard to say. I think uh, for uh, for the certified mills, we have a lot of confidence in the data that exists. So because of the bon sucro calculator and the way the data collection and verification works, uh, we yeah we're very confident about that. We we produce an yearly outcome report that provides averages around all aspects of of the production, right? Carbon emissions, water, fertilization, etc. Um, we have this data split by country as well at an aggregated level. So, you know, it is possible for any mill or farm in India to benchmark themselves against other certified mills or farms in India. But I think the challenge is for the non-certified area. So the, the non-certified area, the data is not being uh, uh, collected through the bon sucro process. I'm sure the mills uh, might have this data for, for, for their farms. So I think uh yeah i think that's really where the challenge is in some countries i think the the industry association collects some level of data across all the mills so i think the 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 most famous case is in brazil where unica does a bit bit of that work and that, and that provides some reference so for example we have uh, a study um, around the greenhouse gas emissions uh, contributors at farm level per country, right? Uh, and to understand how that differs from the non-certified production. Uh, this uh, helps to explain both the impacts of sustainable practices, practices, but also enables the farms and the mills to benchmark themselves, as you said, and identify areas for, for improvement. So yeah, that's what, what we want to do. I think the whole the challenge is really around data collection and data sharing and confidentiality. Uh, I think everyone everywhere is, is struggling with that. So the, I, I wouldn't say there is a, a specific place or company that is doing this very well. Um, and it's something people are, are learning, especially because of these uh, new regulations around due diligence that uh, uh, you mentioned at the start, uh, with, uh, which is requiring a lot more disclosure than, than in the past. So I think having a sustainability report is, uh, is a, a great start. And then the next level is exactly that, the benchmarking, the comparison and learning from, from, from others. In fact, you know, I, I can't resist myself comparing the two sectors, sugar and cement, because I've actually perhaps watched them too close. Uh, you know, in cement sector, Mr. Verma, if you look at that, there is this, uh, you know, kind of a collaborative, which is called the Cement Sustainability Initiative. And... You know, that's one initiative wherein the industry come together. Again, you know, they share a lot of data and, you know, they benchmark the sector and all of that. Any thoughts on creating a parallel in the sugar industry also? Maybe a sugar sustainability initiative kind of a thing. And perhaps, would that be useful? This is to you, Mr. Verma. This is something new that you're talking about. I have no response today, but you can talk talk about it within your uh, company also, and we can certainly take it forward. As I mentioned, this is the right time to now kind of talk or move to sustainability issues. And Shatadri, any thoughts? Yeah. So uh, I agree with Rafael. I mean, uh, uh, and. Uh, the challenges you face, uh, Ritu's point about, you know, coordination, we were lucky to have deep rebel projects with, uh, you know, DSCL, Olam, EID Perry, uh, almost every major sugar company we have worked with. But everywhere we have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, and we generally do not share those information with one group to another. However, what we have done is we have kind of developed our the software, uh, you know, I3SF, 
which has got around 500,000 sugar farmers data in it. And it has got the artificial intelligence integrated into it. So it is machine learning constantly. It has a mechanism of uh, a farmer speaking and getting a response from the top level sugar industry experts about their challenges. And every time a farmer asks questions, the software becomes more smarter. So that way you don't have to share information, but you can use the software that can already provide huge amount of information that you need for your own sugar farmers in your catchment area. Plus you have those implementation guides digital video guides from the countries and that's another thing i'm very proud of for what we have been able to do we have brought together some of the top sugar scientists of our country who retired and wanted a platform to contribute for the sector themselves we didn't bring in people from outside though india we just got the best of the people of our own people to help our own farmers and that's how we have today very proud to have around 35 such scientists who are working with us and providing these inputs for our own farmers, which is benefiting them. All these are happening in video formats, SMSs. And in your place, we are also, uh, Mr. Bharadwaj, we are putting up, you know, uh, uh, those weather stations and, you know, uh, SMS services for the farmers. All this will create a very smart system, ultimately, and that will allow the farmers to benefit. So rather than sharing data and information, I think we need smart softwares that can help the farmers and that is available for every sugar company. We don't charge anything for I3 or so. Right, right, right. Now, before we go back to Ranjan to wrap it up, any final thoughts by anyone, you're welcome to pitch in. You know, we are just about five less than five minutes left now i want to shift gears so um, I'll, i want to present a uh, present a perspective of a conscious consumer uh, vishal we also had a conversation around that uh, we were talking about paddy uh, there are these campaigns going around which are telling people uh, to consume less of rice and then move to some other substitute like we are primarily a rice consumption or a wheat consumption country likewise there are a lot of campaigns going around sugar as well so as of now we are talking about sustainable sugar producing sugar sustainability and reaching out to consumers. There is also a section of consumers which is not consuming as much sugar as they used to. Like uh, at my house and I know a lot of people who have almost cut down on sugar. Uh, should there be a campaign or some information, something around that from the sugar industry itself on their packaging or probably uh, in association with this uh, companies that are buying sugar. So there is a lot of products that are coming out that have a lot of sugar. So they say if the product label has sugar in as the first three elements, we should not be consuming it. Uh, probably some perspective from ESMA as well as sugar producers on that. See, what has happened is one of the most positive properties of sugar is being now shown as a negative property. And the most important and the positive property of sugar is that it is energy. It gives you instant energy. If you look at a laborer working on the roadside, he puts probably two or three spoons of sugar when he has his cup of tea because it gives him instant energy. Now that has become a negative that it says that energy, jada calories agya, it's going to cause a problem. Now, obviously, there is a narrative that we need to really talk about it, and we have from Isma started talking about it, but not at a very large level. We do a small, small seminar, seminars, and we've created a, a small uh, portal called meta.org. We try to give information um, that diabetes is not caused by consuming more sugar. Sugar, it's hereditary. It is not caused by sugar, consuming extra sugar. Yes, you need to eat responsibly. And it is what you need to watch is not sugar. You need to watch calories. And obesity or weight increases not because of sugar consumption alone, it is because of having too much of calcium. Secondly, we do try and convince people that eat as much as you are able to burn. Now, a fellow who is working on the roadside, a laborer cannot have a similar consumption of sugar as, as compared to me sitting on a table job and the whole day sitting on a table and a chair unless I'm able to burn that sugar by doing a slightly more physical activity. So we are trying to convey that to people that 
it's not consumption it is basically lack of physical activity we remember that when i bought my first television it was a manual kind of television i had to go to the television and change the channel now you sit down there and you have um alexa doing everything for you from increasing the speed of your fan or even closing the door or answering your phone or whatever whatever pehle phone hota tha you used to go to the corner of the table and pick up your phone you don't do that anymore so physical activities is the cause of the problem but yes when then i take your point there is need to talk about it and talk properly and we have already started talking about it in a very controlled way because the impression already amongst all of us and some of us here would like to believe ke main chini kam kar dunga to mera bhai great kar jayega i don't know how many of you believe but there would be a few of us who would believe like that so really jumping into that kind of campaign we thought is not proper because immediate retaliation there are a few and a large number of people who have written articles and if you write sugar and health you will find 25 negative articles and probably only one positive article so that's how the world is today so we need to go about it in a very controlled and a very informed way So that is what we are trying to do out through our meta meta dot org. Yes, I did not know about meta dot org. Probably we want to write and probably visit the site and probably out write about that and share it with the stakeholders as well. Uh, yeah, I mean uh, we started. It's not easy, really. I mean, uh, hey, we're trying to do. A, I, I remember when we launched the, this meta dot org. We launched it through the food secretary, Mr. Sudan Shu Pandey. He talked something positive about sugar, and somebody in the news carried. tomorrow in the newspaper saying that the food secretary is asking people to consume more sugar so immediately he got a call from the chairperson of fssai saying that aap kya bol rahe ho i mean so you have to be careful there that's all so any last thoughts we still have 3 minutes to conclude then i can just come come up with the concluding thoughts Um, no, just uh, can I, uh, Ranjan? Sorry, just to add to the the sugar health debate. I think is a, yeah, it's a very complicated uh, topic. And um, what what we in our experience so far, we work very closely to a lot of buyer uh, companies, right, from different sectors. And there is generally a, a huge unwillingness to talk about sustainability in sugar in general. The the simple terms is. you know maybe the science uh, there is science behind the health impacts of consuming sugar it, it doesn't matter if it's terrible for you or if it's not so bad for you the reality is those companies don't want to remind consumers that there is sugar in a product is they they if they can avoid it they will and uh, that's why i think we we see uh, as an opportunity the other uses of sugarcane uh, are really the driver for consumer communications and we see so tetra pak the example i shared before they use the bon sucro logo on their packs uh, on the carton with bioplastics they they are not uh, uh, concerned about communicating about that because it's really positive uh, and it's outside of that health de- health debate so uh, yeah i think that's something t- uh, to bear in mind you know especially i don't know how how it is in india specifically but if you if you're thinking about more increasing consumer engagement around sustainability of uh sugarcane production i think it's very important to maybe emphasize the energy you know the as you said the renewable energy that is generated from the bagas the ethanol the other products uh because at least from our experience maybe it will be different in india but uh, from our experience the the end buyers don't want to talk about sugar unfortunately we would love them to but <laughs> they don't <laughs> So, all right let, let's conclude so yeah it's it's been a very uh, interesting knowledgeable session for me as such because uh, not being from the sugar industry and we also had a lot of perceptions around uh, the water consumption how the sugar is produced and i used to or probably people like me who are outside the industry used to assume or used to presume that it's not that clean uh, industry but now with this conversation it has demystified a lot of things about sugar industry i did not know, know about the bio products that are being produced outside the sugar industry in fact uh, the idea for this conversation happened when we, me and vishal were talking about the corporate social responsibility and then that's where he mentioned sugar industry and then we talked started talking about it and he mentioned a lot of aspects around sugar industry he was saying the information that is out there is not true in the last several decades it's all changed sugar is 
in fact one of the most uh, sustainable and uh, follows the circular economy model so yeah multiple by products almost zero waste and going forward i suppose uh, like vishal mentioned it's important for the stakeholders to come together sit create more platforms like this probably isma can play a leadership role in this and spearhead some of these conversations have more stakeholders more industry participants coming together talking about the sustainability initiatives and what are the aspects what are the areas that should, they should be investing in near future uh, like you mentioned sugar sustainability initiative or something like that that can be taken uh, that can be conceptualized and taken forward maybe we can again meet uh, vishal you'll have to probably accommodate this conversation again 3 months down the line or 6 months down the line and see where all we have moved from here after this conversations uh, we'll create a report we'll share it with isma we'll share it with other industry stakeholders as well put it online uh, we'll definitely visit uh, meetha.org and figure out what are, what is the industry's initiative for focused on uh, making consumers aware about the consumption of sugar as well so yeah eclectic conversations thank you so much for everybody for participating